I just ran into that. I'll just leave you there then. Oh no! <laughs> Out of here! Oh my god! Oh! Oh! No! 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 There are movies that I look back on and I just say to myself, that was amazing. And not only that, but it, I, I, you don't realize it whenever you're watching it, but the pop cultural, just like, just the pop cultural effect that a film has on society and everything. This, because of the performance of Anthony Hopkins specifically, gave pop culture a lot of odd sayings for instance just like well hello Clarice although technically he never did say hello Clarice he always said good evening Clarice or I, I forget like some of the other ways he says there's it. a Mandela effect with that actually yeah I, um, I don't think he actually ever said her name was the thing no he says everybody, her name everybody swears that he says it but it Apparently. Well, he does in the. Uh, I know he does. For instance, whenever she visits him, whenever he's been brought to that his new his like new arrangement, and he's like out of the mental hospital, and instead he's like in the middle of that library prison and everything. I remember he does say it. I rem I remember that so vividly. But he never says hello, Clarice. He says good evening, Clarice. This is also another film that. When I say sweep the Oscars, like there's there's films. All that... he says is good morning. Apparently, no, no. I I know he says it. I know he says her name. It's whenever it's whenever he is at the he's at the new like his new setup instead of being in the mental hospital where he was being held originally. Uh, Jim Carrey imitated him with the misquote in the Cable Guy. His character dons the meat on his face at Medieval Times restaurant. Says hello, Claire. That's where the hello Clarice in correction comes from, but he does say good evening Clarice. Not when they first meet. Nope, not that's not the one I'm talking about. Good morning. Yes, good morning. This is the one I'm talking about. Good evening Clarice. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. So yeah, that's that's the one that's in my head. Uh, but the hello Clarice, he never said hello Clarice. It's misattributed to the cable guy thing. And actually, that was an improv done by Jim Carrey. He like that was not in the script at all. He just did it because he he felt it would be funny, and he had basically the biggest Mandela effect on a lot of people out there. Like I was saying, in terms of like when people talk about sweeping the Oscars, like there's like films that win a lot of Oscars. You know, Oppenheimer swept the Oscars this year because it won I think eight Oscars. And it won some of the big ones, too. I think it won Best Picture, Best Director, I think Best Screenplay. I can't remember. But this film here swept all of the big five Oscars. It won Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Original and Best uh, Adapted Screenplay. It won all five of those. And I don't think it's been done since where a film has literally won, like, every major award at the Academy Awards. <clears throat> and this one, this one to me is one of the best horror-slash-thrillers out there. Because of the visuals, because of the, of the, like, of the impact of Hannibal Lecter, Buffalo Bill, Clarice Starling, uh, heck, even Scott Glenn in this like there's so many great performances and i guess uh i guess you know james and the people that kill or at dead meat have made a kill count concerning silence of the lambs so let's check it out and let's see what's up here we go welcome to the kill count clarice where we tally up the victims <laughs> in all our favorite horror movies and show you how they were made <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I'm...
James A. Janice, and today we're looking at The Silence of the Lambs, released in 1991. It's based on the book of the same name, which was Thomas Harris's follow-up to Red Dragon. But this isn't a sequel to Manhunter. Rather, it's an adaptation of the follow-up book to that movie's source material. Silence of the Lambs follows FBI training Clarice Starling, played by a 27-year-old Jodie Foster. Starling is a gifted student who's pulled into the hunt for Buffalo Bill, a serial killer with a penchant for skinning his victims. Unlike Manhunter's Will Graham, Clarice has no real authority and is constantly framed in claustrophobic, overbearing shots. It's way different than the open environments we often saw Graham in. Clarice is always underestimated by the men around her, and she has to constantly prove herself to them. And this theme isn't subtle. I promise that if this movie came out today, a bunch of grifters on YouTube would be yelling that it's woke. Aiding in Sterling's investigation is Dr. Hannibal Lecter, a brilliant psychiatrist and chronic people eater. Here, Lecter is played by Anthony Hopkins, who nabbed a Best Leading Actor Oscar for the role despite only 24 minutes of screen time. In fact, Silence of the Lambs cleaned up at the Academy Awards. It's the third of only three movies to win the so-called oh, yeah. Big Five, taking home Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actress, Best Actor, and a writing win for Best Adapted Screenplay. It is the only- Yeah. Also, also another thing too was I, that he mentioned is just like, this film will be considered woke. Not really. It's because they play to Clarice's strengths and they're subtle about how she's treated. They aren't like overwhelmingly like just like shoving like the symbolism down your throat. Instead, it's told through genius directing by Jonathan Demme. And once again, like this film's not woke. This film is just honest horror movie to ever win the Oscar for Best Picture, which I think speaks to its broad appeal. As mentioned in the Manhunter kill count, despite the two movies sharing characters, they're entirely different in pretty much every other way. I think yeah. Silence is a more mainstream movie, and that's not a judgment of quality, I just don't know how else to put it. Manhunter is an- Well, no, Manhunter was artistically, like, because Manhunter was obsessed with showing everything white. Like right here, look at all the white that's in the, that's in the shots in these. That's one thing that I noticed about it. So that whenever there's like a big like like violent scene that has blood in it, it feels more effective. If like you feel like and like you see the blood and you notice it more because you've been so whitewashed with all the shit going on. Plus this was the eighties, so mm, really figure. different in pretty much every other way. Yeah, like just look at Does this look like the office of an FBI director, of like, uh, of like a leading agent at the FBI. No, that looks like a doctor's office. Exactly! I think Silence is a more mainstream movie. Man, that's not a judgment of quality. I just don't know how else to put it. I think it's a more grounded film. I don't think it's a more mainstream. I think it's more grounded. Because when you're seeing Manhunter and all of these big avant, like these like nouveau looks with like the the friggin' white backgrounds and, like, everything looks like a friggin', like, doctor's office or an Apple storefront. Instead, when you look at everything that's happening in Silence of the Lambs, it feels like a more realistic setup. Like, everything Two feels... Reasons I would attribute it to being more mainstream would be actually... It, as compared to Manhunter, would be because it just hit that pop culture note way more like there's a lot of people i don't think realize manhunter exists and then because i was one of them for a long time oh and then uh the same thing with red dragon i didn't realize red dragon existed but, oh <laughs> um and then uh just in mainstream in general is just kind of like as far as horror films go horror films are a little niche like not everybody really loves horror films like, almost everybody will go see a horror film at least a few times in their life, probably, unless they're just really scared of the idea of trying to give them a shot, you know? I guess. But, like, not everybody is, like, a big horror film fan, but, like, outside of the people that are big horror film fans, a lot of people like this movie. Oh, yes. Like, even if they're not the biggest horror <gasps> fans. My dad's okay with horror films. This is one of his favorite films of all time. I cannot tell you how many times I've, I've heard my dad talk about Silence of the Lambs as like one of his favorite films My ever. mom has seen this movie and my mom doesn't like horror movies. That, there you if go. that tells you anything at all. The fact there that my go. mom knows about this movie and has even quoted, I ate his liver with a fava bean. I can't eat Like, the fact that my mom has said that tells you this is a mainstream movie. Yeah. 
Manhunter is an art piece compared to this yeah. film. Compared to Michael Mann's film, the characters in Silence are much more overstated. Buffalo Bill's more of a bombastic maniac than Francis Dollarhide, and characters like Crawford and Chilton stand out a lot more, as opposed to being just, you know, guys. I mean, free in the rules, but still, he's kind of just a guy. As much as I love Manhunter, there's no denying that Silence of the Lambs is awesome. There's a reason that every other scene in this thing has been parodied and referenced to high hell. Hopkins' Hannibal is an icon of horror villains, and Clarice Starling is one of my- actually voted the number one horror villain of our number one villain of all time and given his impact i could see it favorite film protagonists ever. It's not only considered one of the greatest horror <gasps> movies of all time, but one of the greatest movies, period. It's about damn time we cover it on this show. Will Silence of the Lambs have more? Oh, sorry. First, a word from our sponsors. I was wondering when you'd call. Hello, Jamothy. Hi, you. <laughs> Zorin! Jamothy. <laughs> Damn it, Zorin, you gotta just butt in with, a, with an advert. Yeah, there's been another incident. Imagine my disappointment that you didn't come and see me. And I won't be, you sick son of a bitch. But I do need your expertise. Well, that does sound like quite the pickle. Not at all. I can send you everything you need from right here, thanks to our partner, WeTransfer. Uh, WeTransfer helps 80 million users a month share and send big files all around the world, and it's made for both individuals and teams. I see. That is a solution. Ah, but this is still such sensitive material, and sending it over the internet where anyone could intercept it. Please, I'm no fool. We transfer allows you to password protect any transfer. Ah, I see. Damn. Nonetheless, I'm afraid I'm not one for <clears> all <throat> this data sharing. Wouldn't want my personal information going to the wrong people. Well, then we're in luck, because we transfer doesn't collect your personal info. Oh, I see. Any more objections? No. Great. Hey, Fiona, could you get those files to Zorin, please? Uh, so you can edit that to the numbers bit by tomorrow, right? Oh yeah, that's no problem. Thanks, man. The editors have been swamped with production tales from hell. Right! How's that going, by the way? Oh, great! The first episode released last Sunday, and it was about Poltergeist. And this Sunday, we'll have an episode on Troll 2. And viewers can use the link in the description to go to our production... Yeah, that's their new, uh, their new program that they're doing. Uh, you know, they got the, you know, they got the Kill Count, and they got the Dead Meat Podcast. And then there's this, Production Tales from Hell. I saw a preview of it and saw some clips of the uh, Poltergeist one. It looks interesting because they talk so, about like the behind-the-scenes stuff. I think I saw a mention that this was coming up with the Troll 2 one because I remember seeing the Oh My God guy, you know, yeah, posted the, recently. I think it was him that was sharing about it. Production Tales from Hell Portal, where they can download an exclusive zine with BTS and custom artwork, as well as commentary tracks featuring me, Chelsea, and Chauncey for each movie Production Tales is covering. Will the Silence of the Lambs have more kills than Oscar wins? Let's find out and get to them. The, the kills, not the Oscars. Yes. The movie begins in the woods, near Quantico. It's the home of the FBI, I say, I where feel like at least Starling seven is or making her way through a training this. montage, yeah. complete with a Rocky sweatshirt and Rocky sweat stains. Before she can reach the Philadelphia Museum, she's summoned by Jack Crawford, the head of the behavioral science unit. Starling is something of a star pupil and a former student of Crawford's. You grilled me pretty hard, as I recall, on the Bureau of Civil Rights record in the Hoover years. I gave you an A. A minus, sir. Also extremely likable right off the bat. Crawford has a little extra credit for her, helping him out with his latest project. He's interviewing imprisoned serial killers, just like Jonathan Groff and Mindhunter, which is fitting since both characters are based on the same real-life FBI agent, John E. Douglas. In fact, Crawford's actor Scott Glenn spent four days with Douglas as preparation for this role. Crawford says there's one kill- That's awesome. Oh, yeah. I mean, picking the brain of one of the best behavioral scientists to, like, help build criminal profiling uh, in terms of, like, for serial killers and stuff like that. I mean, the man, the man is, like, infamous for being one of the brightest minds for, like, figuring, figuring people out, and, like, getting a good bead on, like, behavior and, like, what it means at the core of it and everything. Killer who refuses to talk to them. The psychiatrist Hannibal Lecter. 
Hannibal the cannibal. I always wondered if Hannibal only chose to eat people after realizing it'd make for a sweet rhyme. Crawford says he's sending Clarice yeah. for general purposes, but judging by the pictures on his wall, this probably has something to do with a killer they're trying to find named Buffalo Bill. When she gets to the sanitarium, its director Dr. Chilton assumes Crawford sent her because she's a pretty young thing that'll turn Hannibal on. Oh, are you ever his taste? Phrasing! Chilton was a character yeah. in Manhunter, but was largely forgettable there. Here, he's played by Anthony Heald, who makes him stand out with sleaze. Will you be in Baltimore? overnight because this can be quite a fun town if you have the right guide dog you couldn't even guide a boat without blowing yourself up clarice manages yeah. to ditch the smarmy doctor giving her one-on-one -on -one time with hannibal's plight orderly barney i'll be watching you'll do fine as yeah it uh, oh yeah he was in manhunter as well that's the other thing too is just uh in the Manhunter kill count, this is Frankie Faison playing a different character than he did in that movie. Thankfully, Barney will stick around for a couple more films. In stark yeah. contrast to the sterile white cell in Manhunter, in this movie, Hannibal is kept in a freaking dungeon. It houses other inmates too, like multiple Migs, who's got a keen scent for sniffing out the worst things to say. <laughs> At the end Thank you. Oh, what a dis despicable disgusting human being mm -hmm. of the row is hannibal lecter who's inhumanly sinister from the very first sight of him good morning much better manners than migs though he's the main event you'd expect him to be with a gaze that pierces through the camera as much as it does his plexiglass cell hannibal yeah. was originally going to be kept behind bars but director jonathan demi wasn't happy with how they obfuscated the actors he worried it would ruin the intimacy of their scenes together production designer chris zia came up with the solution of a plexiglass cell she also designed the dungeon based on a photo of where the nuremberg war criminals were held before trial. The dungeon was a Damn. set built in the abandoned Westinghouse factory, while the institution's interiors were filmed at the Allegheny County Jail in Pittsburgh, where most of the movie was shot. Clarice is obviously mm. scared of Hannibal, but nevertheless, she persists. That gets him to open up a bit, sniffing out her skincare routine and showing off his art. That is the Duomo scene. Now, funnily the enough, that uh, dungeon area looks a crap ton like um, one of the ones in one of the Sherlock Holmes games. Really? Mm -hmm. Huh. So whoever the guy is, he's like a, ma a major Sherlock Holmes villain, villain that uses a lot of poison and stuff. I don't know. He's being held there and there's like a whole situation where you have to go with Watson to the station and they're supposed to be being let in to talk to him and then midway through them being there, he escapes. And Ooh. you're having to investigate exactly like how that went down and everything. And come to find out it's because... Sherlock needed him for something. Oh. <laughs> it was actually Sherlock's doing it. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, dear. What a refined young cannibal. She fumbles when she tries to transition to the business at hand, which gets Lecter roasting her like the meanest gay you've ever met. You know what you look like to me with your good bag and your cheap shoes? You look like a rube. He said that to her face. When she still doesn't back down, he tries intimidation, telling her how he ate a census worker and the best way to make bubbles in a pool. <laughs> Hopkins actually <laughs> didn't intend for that noise to become such a thing. Oh, God. It, okay. Uh, her thing... You look like a rube. At, at that point, or she's like... Her character actually from West Virginia should be like, well, I am from West Virginia, so I'm used to being called that. So... <laughs> down, he tries intimidation, telling her how he ate a census worker and the best way to make bubbles in a pool. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Hopkins actually didn't intend for that noise to become such a thing. I put that in at the end, just for a joke. I thought they'd cut it out. He scares Clarice <laughs> off, but on her way out, multiple Migs hits her with some pocket sand. Oh, wait. Oh, God, that's not sand. Man, there's something about... Disgusting. Yeah, that's The indiscretion gross. offends Hannibal, so he gives Clarice a tip, saying to look inside herself and seek out a patient of his named Miss Moffat. She heads to the library for the requisite microfilm research scene. Gotta love him. Until she's interrupted Every by her time. friend Ordelia, played by Casey Lemons, who was last seen on the kill count to the OG Candyman. She tells Clarice she's got a call from Crawford, who informs her that multiple Migs is dead. He was convinced by Hannibal with words alone to swallow his own tongue. Damn, what can't you do with that mouth, Hannibal boy? <laughs> Clarice decodes. Once again, once again, the just Hannibal, how he's able to dissect people without even looking at them. Just her, like, because from what they described, he basically was just saying words to Migs, and before he knew it, before they knew it, that was it. It's Hannibal's riddle of so looking I don't think it's actually her. possible to swallow your own tongue. No, it is. You bite it off and you swallow it. Oh, yeah. If you bite it off, yeah. 
That's the point. That when they say swallow your own tongue, that's what they mean because oh. typically you can't swallow something unless you chew it up self to mean a place called your self storage. There's a unit there registered to one Hester Moffat that's been sitting unused for years. The door to the place is jammed and since the dude who owns it isn't any help, Clarice jacks herself to victory. Wow, Migs really rubbed off on her. Or should I say rubbed one off on her. Inside this Stop it. Stop it storage unit, Clarice finds a car, and it ain't got Leo and Kate having steamy sex inside. Instead, it's got Aww. a headless body, as well as a bodiless head, later revealed to belong to Benjamin Raspell, a former patient of Hannibal's. Everyone involved in this movie, from Jodie Foster to writer Ted Talley, wanted to find the proper balance when it came to the story's horrific violence. They didn't want to shy away from it, but they also didn't want to be exploitative. It's possible to, to do a picture that is about violence and not make it about getting off on the violence. The dark subject matter caused Michelle Pfeiffer to turn down the role of Clarice and Gene Hackman to step away after being set to play Jack Crawford and direct. Gene read the script and said, you know, this is too violent for me. I can't do it, and I'm walking away from it. As a director, Hackman was go. replaced by the late Jonathan Demme. Hi. I'm Jonathan Demi. It was a weird That's choice complete. since his earlier films were more comedic, but he also directed Stop Making Sense, the greatest concert film ever made, so he's unimpeachable to me. It ended up working for the cast and crew, who all said they had a great time thanks to Demi keeping things light on set. The paradox of filming this was that it's such a dark film, and it was such a delightful experience for everybody. It was <laughs> a lot of fun. Meanwhile, yeah, John, John Demi. That's from, good to hear. Well, dude, well, here's the thing. Everyone talks about like John Demi anyone who's ever worked with him like said that he's just an absolute hoot to work with or it was to work with and it's sad that he's not around anymore because a lot of people say that he was one of those directors who had great work in him in almost any decade much like Scorsese Scorsese like some directors can direct a great film every decade or can give you a great film in one decade some some can give you multiple in one decade then the great like true great ones give you a great one at least once every decade and scorsese does that and demi was the same way because he he did documentaries he did this film and he's done multiple I, gosh it's sad when the good ones go Meanwhile, the role of Clarice went to Jodie Foster, who was just coming off an Oscar win for The Accused. Foster was a fan of the book and called up Orion Pictures when she found out they bought the rights from Dino De Laurentiis after Manhunter flopped. She was drawn to Clarice's quiet internal strength, especially after playing victims for so much of her career. Yeah. For me, the reason that it was so important to make this movie was that there was a sort of healing process and almost like a growing up process to finally playing the woman who saves the women. After getting the role, Foster wanted to make sure the movie didn't portray the FBI as goofy or inept. You might not know this, but it's fucking buck wild, man. In 1981, John Hinckley Jr. tried to assassinate- I remember this. Oh my God. Have you heard about this shit? Okay, sorry. I, I'll let it roll and I won't interrupt. This, but it's fucking buck wild, man. In 1981, John Hinckley Jr. tried to assassinate newly inaugurated President Ronald Reagan. His motivation was to impress Jodie Foster, whom he became obsessed with and stalked after seeing her in Taxi Driver. The FBI protected her during his stalking attempts and helped out production for this movie, providing their campus and firing range of sets. They figured the film would help them recruit female agents. Clarice makes another appointment with Hannibal, who says that Raspell was an early- they, they cut out a little bit there. Turns out John Hinckley, after trying to kill the president, was eventually paroled after, you know, receiving, like, the proper treatments and everything. He apologized to everyone involved. He apologized to Jodie Foster. And he, right now, he's free, and he makes bluegrass music. Hmm. So, like, it is possible for the system to actually reform people if it's done correctly. Yes. Uh, here's the thing, I'm never going to say that the prison system that we have in this country is the best. <laughs> prison industrial complex and everything, ain't that a bitch. But true reform and like those who do wish to truly help themselves, I do believe in to a certain degree. Although, here's the thing, when someone does, you know, when someone does wrong, it is proper to... Keep an eye on them, because even though they may be on the straight and narrow, I am not one to give chance to that happening again. By no means, like, keep them locked up, but... Trust, but 
clarify. Exactly. And it also depends, in my opinion, on what they did, too. Well, yeah. That's the other thing, too. Like, if they were, like, a career criminal who, like, stole from, like, mega corp- corporations and shit like that, I wouldn't keep tabs on them. Well, in my opinion, I give I'm a shit. less Fuck upset them. at the fact that he actually failed his attempt to kill someone. Yeah. He almost succeeded. He if should, he actually he, killed he, him, then I would say, really? Like, they just let him go after that? Like, Well... That's the thing, though. Which I really don't think if you actually kill a president that the federal government's ever going to leave. Either. Oh, no. You're you're basically... Dude, you're basically done after that. Hell, You Jay- better have had a whole lot of other people at your back, and you guys better be in charge now if that's what you... If yeah, you, if you Jay- have killing the president on your resume, otherwise the federal government's never letting you go again. Yeah. For, for instance, James Earl Ray, who killed Martin Luther King Jr., never saw the light of day ever again basically he was in prison like he had no chance of parole that's the thing and he succeeded in killing king but here's the thing with him in terms of reform he fully reformed because he repented in front of like coretta scott king dr king's widow came to visit him at, at his request and he begged her for forgiveness like he literally sat there at a table with her cried and confessed of just like him you know grow you know just like understanding you know that what he did was 100 percent wrong and why he did it was not right and that he can't like he feels like he can't move on with his life until he until he achieves forgiveness and coretta scott king after everything that she after everything that that man put her like did to her husband and everything she forgave him, and then James, basically, just after that, he like he spent the rest of his days just like sitting in prison, sitting in his prison cell, reading the Bible, and then he passed away. And you see, yeah, it's reform can work, but to me, I also believe there are some that are just so far gone that it's impossible, because. It's like Whitey Bulger. Whitey Bulger was an evil, evil, evil bastard. Who I think, who, when I found out what they did to, what the, what they did to him in prison, like, because there was a riot, and they, they got him in his cell by himself, basically, just, he was unrecognizable after the guy was done with him. But I don't have any, I have zero sympathy for Whitey Bulger after everything he did. Early victim of Buffalo Bills. Lecter only found his patient after he was dead. Best thing for him, really. His therapy was going nowhere. Hannibal implies he knows who Buffalo Bill is and offers up the name for a price. A room with a view. Not like the E.M. Forster book, an actual room with, like, a window and shit. While Starling ponders that deal, in Memphis, Tennessee, a woman sings to Tom Petty with some Fallon-caliber lip-syncing. She's so into the song, she doesn't realize she's being watched by a splinter cell-looking Buffalo Bill. He lures her over with an arm cast and some dramatic grunting. When she offers to help him, he maneuvers her into the back of his van. The Good Samaritan is repaid with an off-screen beating and an extended timpani roll. Buffalo Bill checks the size tag on her outfit, and it's a fit for him. Only because actress Brooke Smith gained 25 pounds to play the role. Then Bill ruins the dress's resale value and makes off into the night. Clarice is still on a Rocky regiment, but gets pulled out early by her instructor. As they walk past the Universal Studios stunt show, she's informed she's being flown out to West Virginia, where another Buffalo Bill victim has been found. Her death matches all the others. Bill kept her alive for three days. And he shoots them, skins them, and dumps them. Jack Crawford is played by Scott Glenn, an ex-Marine who you might know as Stick from Daredevil, or from the GQ article highlighting his geriatric badassery. Nice, yes. dude. He gives Clarice <laughs> Buffalo... He, the dude is always in shape. I don't understand it. Always has a six-pack, always ripped to the freaking gills. Scott Glenn's a bad motherfucker. Bill's case file, which includes some photos of his first victim, Frederica Bimmel. But just a reminder, and it's tricky with these crime films, pictures of people who we never meet in video form don't go on the kill count. They arrive at the funeral home where we Did get we a Did we meet that clap. one guy who turned up dead, the, uh, like the second one on the count, before he turned up dead? Oh, the head in the jar? Yeah. Uh, no, but where it was actually physically dead. James has said this in the past, if the body or pieces okay. of person are physically there, even though we never officially met them, it does count. But pictures do not. 
Oh. And I tend to agree with that because physical evidence versus photographic evidence, yeah, it's, it's neither here nor there. Of feds and local forces, Crawford eases the tension with some good old fashioned guy talk. Well, I mean, if you were going to count pictures of people who are deceased, like, then, I mean, like, you'd have to count, like, one of the old presidents, like, so there's a picture of George Washington in the background. There you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the other thing, too. It's just like, well, George Washington died years ago. Put him on the list. <laughs> like, oh, George. And even the presidents who weren't dead at the time, like the sitting president, he, well, actually, no, yeah, the sitting president in this film was George H.W. Bush, and he's dead. It's just like, oh, there's a picture of George H.W. Bush. He passed away not too long ago. Put him on the list. Yeah. But anyway, sorry. Crawford eases the tension with some good old-fashioned guy talk. This type of sex crime has certain aspects I just as soon discuss in private. You know what I mean? They step aside for a man to man, which leaves Clarice shut out with condescending stares from the men surrounding her. She escapes the prying eyes by stepping into a room with crying eyes. But she's not crashing a stranger's funeral here. She's just having a traumatic flashback to her father's death, which happened when she was 10. And since it's in video form, I will go ahead and put him on the count. She snaps back to reality when Crawford calls her inside oh, and regains some around. authority by clearing the room of all its men. I guess there ain't enough coke to share with the whole class. Just kidding. It's something that masks the smell, since not even the coroner played by producer Kenneth Ott can hide his disgust. Uh, Buffalo Bill 6. Is that Ether? Um, Ether or uh, later on they actually used a, it was like a, uh, what was it? it? It was like a mint rub kind of thing. I forget what it was called. Basically you just rub it under there and it masks it with the, and the mint smell overpowers the smell of death. The victim has had her scalp removed, along with two disconcerting diamond-shaped skin segments from her back. Effects artist Carl Fullerton designed the makeup throughout the movie without the use of prosthetics or dummies. The movie's corpses were real actresses who had to lie still while being naked in water or cold conditions. It was very tough on, on them in many cases, I think. But they did smile when they were finished. <laughs> <laughs> Clarice proves her worth when she sees something down the victim's throat, which gives way to my favorite line delivery of the film. When a body comes out of the water, lots of times there's like leaves and things in the mouth. Black leaves and things but it ain't leaves and things in there unbelievably that that actor is a great character i forget his name but do you remember like the 1989 batman film i mean that already exists okay but do you remember the joker's main henchman bob no okay he plays bob and the fact that those two are the are this that bob from batman 1989 and this guy are the same person it's just like dang talk about range dog it's an insect cocoon. Clarice quickly preserves the specimen and takes it to the town's Donisau district. At a museum there, she meets two entomologists named Pilcher and Rodin, the latter of whom is played by Dan Butler. I was going to say. Museum there, she meets two entomologists named Pilcher and... Hey, don't point that crooked eye at me, Carl. I'll knock it straight. <laughs> and Rodin, the latter... Sorry. <laughs> I had to do it because of the... Uh, had to do it because of the, uh, the, the goon. I love, I love that. I love, I really wish they'd released the film already, damn it. Matter of whom is played by Dan Butler, who assisted Will Graham in Manhunter. Starling's more comfortable with Bob Bug Guy Briscoe and his buddy Pilcher. She's even a bit receptive to Pilcher's flirting and snow-piercing blue eyes. You ever go out for cheeseburgers and beer? Are you hitting on me, doctor? Yes. And in the book, <laughs> these two actually end up together. Unfortunately for movie Pilcher, he stopped short of asking her out when Rodin identifies the insect as a death's head moth, a species that only lives in Asia. These exotic moths have to be specially cared for, which is our cue to visit the home of Buffalo Bill, whose place is part moth nursery, part house of wax. His many moths were provided by insect wrangler Ray Mendez, who also provided the nasty roaches in the final segment of Creepshow. Mendez oh. created a fake cocoon Ooh. for the autopsy scene made out of Tootsie Rolls and gummy bears in case the actress swallowed it. He also also designed the one they cut open, which squeezed out the KY jelly. Gross. Oh. Buffalo Bill's lair includes a nightmare wishing well, and stuck at the bottom of it is the woman from Tennessee. Bill's keeping her alive and moisturized, giving her lotion to apply while he and his dog Precious supervise. It puts the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. Gets a little spooked. That's another one that was quoted all the friggin' time. Mm -hmm. My god. 
spectacular during cleanup time, though. What's a fucking ocean in the basket? The woman is revealed via news report to be Catherine Martin, the only daughter of U.S. Senator Ruth Martin. With the case involving Congress critters now, Clarice is sent for another meeting with Hannibal, much to the annoyance of Chilton. He is my patient. I have rights. Dude thinks of himself as Lecter's greatest rival. Thinks I'm his nemesis. Calm down, Ginsburg. He doesn't think of you at all. No, you're more like... You're more like that bump on a turd that occasionally causes a hindrance, but nevertheless is flush like everything else. I was just Clarice thinking he's probably him. like number eight on the menu. <laughs> so he's going to get to trying it one day. He's just not sure exactly when. And he's just like, that oh, seems a bit gammy and maybe a little too stringy, but I might give it a try. Hannibal a transfer to a different facility and an annual beach vacation if he gives up Buffalo Bill. Hannibal offers a counterproposal. Quick pro quo. I tell you things, you tell me things. Not about this case, though. About yourself. Despite an earlier order from Crawford to avoid sharing personal information, Clarice recounts the painful memory of how her father was killed trying to stop a robbery. That tasty tidbit earns her an insect analysis from Dr. Lecter, who notes that the moth is symbolic of change. Caterpillar into chrysalis or pupa and from thence into beauty. Our belly wants to change too. He advises her to check nearby medical centers, surmising that Buffalo Bill has been rejected for sex reassignment surgery. The Silence of the Lambs has a complicated cultural legacy when it comes to transgender and homosexual representation. And don't start whining about me getting political, okay? You can't not talk about this stuff when analyzing this film. The this is true. Well, again, the thing with Buffalo Bill is that Bill was denied uh, denied gender reassignment, and also not only that, but also Bill suffers from... <sighs> Bill suffers from multiple mental illnesses, and the transgenderism is not the, is not the result of all these mental illnesses. The transgenderism is just something that Bill, that Bill wants to, like, Bill wants to have that be his reality but unfortunately he was denied that and therefore it just added to the pile of just all of his mental stresses that eventually made him just go off the go off the deep end and start doing this shit once again it's just like trying to figure out like because there's serial killers out there who've done horrible awful terrible things and do we know 100 percent why they did what they did no and we never will. Do you know why? Because it's impossible. Like, especially if the person is killed or dies before they're caught. But... But even then, you can't always trust everything they say. Exactly. That's the thing. It's just like... They basically build up the delusion in their mind that they're right. And anyone who questions them or tries to extract information... Like, they're wrong. And why would I ever... Why would they ever reveal anything to anybody? But anyway, sorry. The movie specifically points out that Buffalo Bill isn't actually trans. Billy is not a real transsexual, but he thinks he is. He tries to be. Clarice also chimes in with a defense, although it may seem a bit patronizing. There's no correlation in the literature between transsexualism and violence. Transsexuals are very passive. Director Demi was always adamant that Buffalo Bill wasn't gay and felt that audiences misinterpreted the character. Similarly, actor Ted Levine did a lot of research and discussion with drag queens and the gay community and considered Buffalo Bill Bill, a homophobic heterosexual whose behavior mocked gay men. Still, the movie Serial Killer is a mentally ill crossdresser, which was probably harmful in 1991. Back then, a lot of the audience would have been less familiar with these ideas and might have assumed that all trans people were like this. The movie was picketed by protesters, who also distributed leaflets at the New York Film Critics Award, which Demi encouraged people to engage with. He said, I think that was extremely gracefully done. And I think we should all read these and pay very close attention to the message. In later years, Demi said he should have done more to emphasize the character wasn't gay. Nowadays, we have a much broader spectrum of gay characters in media, so Buffalo Bill is no longer a singular depiction of a differing sexuality. Maybe I will say this, uh, that's true, but at the same time, they do go overboard with some things. For instance, the one with, uh, the one in Doctor Who where Davros who is in a wheelchair, by the way, who is a wheelchair-bound, like, enemy, who's a villain, basically, they got rid of Davros's wheelchair because they said, oh, we don't want to have the negative connotation of someone in a wheelchair being a bad guy. As 
all of the other heroes that are in wheelchairs that are good guys. I mean, it. There's just times that where it's just like, dude. I mean, I was like, I think you could have gotten away with it if Professor X was fighting him. Like, well, there you go. Because like people would have been like, oh yeah, well it's balanced, you know, he's fighting somebody else that's like him. Like, well, and, and to me, I just but, once I mean, again, people are just apt to just be like, oh well, this is painting people of a certain like feature in a bad light. Well, here's like, the thing. No, it's uh, it's 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 fiction. It is, and this has always been my thing. It's like. Do overweight, overweight middle Americans get offended at the idea of Homer Simpson? No. I mean, they should because he's a loud, drunk, fat, lazy, like, sack of shit who takes advantage of, like, his family life and just his overall setup that, or his overall, like, place in life. But should, like, and should middle Americans be pissed about that? By the scale of which people... Like judge stuff nowadays, yes. They should be, but guess what? They're not. Because guess what? It's fictional. It doesn't exist. Homer Simpson is not a real person. Much like Buffalo Bill is not a real person. And you shouldn't just assume that just because this character shares traits or acts a certain way or anything like that, you shouldn't uh, automatically thrust yourself into it and just be like, this hurts me because... I think this person's like me. That doesn't mean that the person who made the film or who's playing the character is doing the bad thing. No, that's you being uncomfortable with yourself, and that sounds like something you need to work on. And I and I, I hope that you do get help for it. I, I, My whole thing is, is like they're painting it like, oh, people are gonna see this and assume that like all gay people or transsexual people are like this, you know. And I'm just like, I never once had that thought. When no, I, saw this movie. I thought that Buffalo Bill. This guy is a fucked up individual. That's what I thought. I didn't think like, oh, this is how all gay people are. Or how all trans people are. No. Never once. No, I was just like, oh yeah, he's a serial killer who also happens to be like a cross-dressing serial killer. Yes. Like, it was just a character trait he had. Like, I never once like attributed it to like, oh, that must be what everybody who cross-dresses does in their spare time. is just murder people in a well in their house. And and, like build, how, and build human how skin suits. Do you have to be to think that? It's once again lack of critical thinking skills, dude. That's what, that's how I always look at it. It's like, just, I'm sure there are a few brain dead rednecks who think shit like that, but they're a little fucking exception. And like, they're not the rule. Nobody should give their opinions the time of day in the first place. Number one, number one rule of determining shit: like, you never use the extremes to justify the norm, hmm. never, because that's where you're just going to completely throw so much stuff under the bus and you're just going to miss all fa all the facts and logic and reason. And that's why I've seen some people reclaim him and celebrate the character's camp. Dr. Chilton has been listening in on Hannibal and Clarissa's meeting and finds out the deal Clarice offered was a phony one thrown out by Jack Crawford. He tattles and it gets Crawford and Starling in trouble with Jack's Love boss, that mask FBI Director Hayden Burke. Yeah, <laughs> I remember him saying that that was very uncomfortable. I'm sure it was. And he sat through it because he he sat through it because he knew that it would basically add to the performance because if it's like that and you know just like that because people will notice that and it'll make them uncomfortable and that's Hannibal Lecter's job to make people uncomfortable mm -hmm. whether it's him doing stuff to people or something that's being done to him but also yeah this right here Doctor Ch this is what made me really hate Doctor Chilton. I thought Dr. Chilton was a nuisance. Here, he just proves that he's in it for himself and fuck, like, trying to help the, the young lady. Mm -hmm. He's played by legendary horror producer Roger Corman in a brief cameo oh, yeah. since Demi worked for him early in his career. It's always weird to see his name in the opening credits. Chilton <laughs> makes a move and negotiates a real bargain on go with Senator Martin. He's so busy printing about the victory that he leaves his pen behind in Lecter's cell. But I'm sure that won't be a big deal. Hannibal says he'll only reveal Buffalo Bill's identity to the senator in person, so he's flown to Tennessee and wheeled out in front of her wearing a mask. This infamous face wear, which also works as good royal rumble attire, <laughs> went through several iterations in 
pre-production, some more fencing inspired and others more uh, dumb. Costume designer Colleen Atwood landed on the final look, an unpainted fiberglass mask that has a bit of a Jason edge to it. Maybe since it was made by a New Jersey hockey mask manufacturer. Hmm. Although he can't nibble anyone through it, Hannibal can still share Buffalo Bill's real name. He says it's Louis Friend and that he met him once because he was lovers with his patient Benjamin Raspel. You know, the head in a jar guy. The deal is going well, but Hannibal almost blows it when he starts talking about the senator's nips. Toughened your nipples, didn't it? He brings hey. it back by giving the senator Buffalo Bill's address, his physical description, and a compliment. Oh, and senator, just one more thing. Love your suit. It's hard to imagine a time when Anthony Hopkins wasn't a household name, but originally, Sean Connery was the more commercial-friendly pick for Hannibal. When he turned it down, Demi cast Hopkins based on his performance in The Elephant Man. Jodie Foster didn't get to Damn. talk to him until they were already in production. We did a table reading of the entire movie, and he scared me to death. <laughs> <laughs> At least the feeling was mutual. And I was scared to speak to you. I thought, she just won enough, another Oscar. In exchange for the intel, Cannibal... Well, that's the thing. Both of them are very well-respected actors in their own right. Anthony Hopkins in, like, the British, in, like, the British, like, film scene and, like, even on stage over in the UK is a legend before he even came to the States. Whereas Jodie Foster, where she started in Hollywood so young, like, she literally got nominated for an Oscar when she was 13. In Taxi Driver, which, by the way, oh boy, that's fucked up. Yeah, she plays a child prostitute. Oof, God. It's not good. Hannibal's moved to a cell in the middle of a museum, which in real life was the Soldiers and Sailors Museum in Pittsburgh, PA. It's an excellent tableau for a sophisticated sociopath. He's gotta love being in there. Clarice arrives for one final encounter with him, but careful girl, don't laugh at his jokes too much. People will say we're in love. She says she's figured out the info he gave the senator is bogus. Your anagrams are showing, Doctor. Lewis, Lewis friend. friend. Iron sulfide, also known as, as fool's gold. She pries for the truth, but he reminds her of their quid pro quo agreement. In an uncomfortable close-up, Starling recalls how she was sent to live with her cousins on a ranch. She ran away after hearing their sheep being slaughtered overnight. A sound Lecter says probably haunts her. Wake up in the dark and hear the screaming of the lamb. Huh. I think they got the movie title wrong. Her quid pro bro <laughs> gives another clue and says Buffalo uh, Bill's... Well, this is the thing. This is one of those films that never really says its title you know like transformers says it a lot um there's a lot of films that say it and it's actually a joke with cinema sins like every time they say the name of the movie roll credits in this this is one of those rare ones where they never say the name of it they say like things that are close but never right on the money motivation isn't sexual. He does, however, covet his victim's bodies in a certain way, and Clarice should know all about that. Don't you feel eyes moving over your body, Clarice? I mean, how could she not? So much of the movie features Clarice being stared at by men, and Demi made it more obvious by casting tall dudes to tower over the diminutive Foster. Yeah. They emphasized it even more by well, shooting... Well, it's easy, because Jodie Foster's like a tiny, tiny woman. She's only like 5'3", I think scenes from Clarice's point of view, with characters staring directly into the camera lens. Starling and Lecter are interrupted by Chilton and a blink and you'll miss him, George Romero. They take her Holy away before shit. Lecter can reveal Bill's real name. As Clarice takes a speedy plane back home, Hannibal draws a speedy portrait of his favorite gal. His oh, guards arrive no. to deliver dinner and handcuff him to cell bars to prevent any funny business. But it's finally time for Cheka, I mean Chilton's pen to come into play, as Hannibal uses it to pick the lock. He slaps the cuffs back onto Lieutenant Boyle, then sinks his teeth into Sergeant Pembry. Guy must have taken to pretty bland though since Hannibal seasons him with pepper spray. Then he gives Boyle an off-screen beating before celebrating the new freedom of his wrists. Downstairs, muffled gunshots and elevator movement sends this 90s police squad up to the fifth floor. Yeah, guy, I'm sure Hannibal's up on the ceiling behind you. What are you doing? <laughs> like there's nowhere to be seen, but they do find Boyle's disemboweled corpse, yeah. which Hannibal has strung up in an impressive angel display. Production designer Chris Zia based this on a painting by Francis Bacon. Pembry is discovered still breathing, but with a face that looks a little worse for wearing or sorry uh, worse for wear oh you, you look real good there yeah you look <laughs> yeah, very convincing, dude. As Pembry is rolled away by paramedics, the officers notice blood leaking from the roof of the elevator. The SWAT team is called in, and they find what appears to be Hannibal's body, but soon realize it's a dead Sergeant Pembry, who's not only missing his uniform, but also his face. That means the person wheeled out was Hannibal, who now reveals himself in the ambulance. Clarice is told of Hannibal- Still one of the most badass reveals ever yeah. in film history. 
Like, they lead into it so good. And then right when he sits up, you're like, no, no, <laughs> face comes off. Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so good. I remember... Like, it didn't blow my mind quite as much as, like, the end of Saul, but... No, like, no. It was still just, like, yo. <laughs> I remember... Oh, my God. I remember when we watched, when me and Quinn watched this. Oh, my God. That was so good. Such a great reveal. Hannibal's escape by Ordelia, who also tells her he killed the ambulance crew. That means I'll count the two paramedics who were with him. One who got in the driver's seat, and one who was shown in the back when Hannibal took off Pembry's face. The two students look over <laughs> Buffalo Bill's case file again, and Clarice realizes something about his first victim, Frederica Bimmel. If he truly coveted her, like Hannibal insists, he was probably familiar with her and even saw her every day. Hot damn, Clarice. You knew her. That's the thing. Well, that's the thing with serial killers. They always... The first victim is always the one they're the most familiar with. That's why that's that's why the thing is it's always important to determine who was the first victim. Because if you can determine who the first victim is, then you can start asking around like circles of friends. And then outside of those circles of friends, you get acquaintances, acquaintances. And then you have run-ins and just stuff like that and just you go by the various like like groups and just like expand your investigation out and by doing that usually they're able to decipher who the killer is because of the relevance to the first victim it's actually a very important point of investigation she drives to Frederica's hometown of Belvedere, Ohio, to meet the girl's father, who looks like he subscribes to the Vivich School of Grief Management. He lets her look around his daughter's bedroom, where she finds some hidden pictures confirming that Frederica had a secret lover. But she doesn't figure everything out until she looks in the closet and sees a dressmaking pattern reminiscent of the skin bill cut from his sixth victim. He's making himself a woman's suit, Mr. Crawford, out of real women. Crawford tells her good job, but chill out. They've already cracked the case. Based on Starling's work with the bug cocoon, they track down a tailor by the name of James Gum. Customs had some paper on it. They stopped a carton two years ago at LAX. Live caterpillars from Suriname. Clarice wants to join Crawford at Gum's home address outside Chicago, but he tells her to stay put. The men will handle the dangerous work. They need her to find evidence linking Gum to Frederica's murder. She ends up getting the address of Frederica's old employer, a local woman named Mrs. Littman. Back in Bill's house of horrors, Catherine's still down in a hole, losing her soul. She'd like to fly, but her wings have been so denied, and her only chance at freedom is a page out of Pirates of the Caribbean. Come on, take that boat. Come on. <laughs> wow, that is one seriously fluffy dog. <laughs> that's the thing with it is just the the dog i didn't want anything bad to happen to the dog the dog didn't do nothing wrong mm. plus it's a sweet looking dog there's a little oh, fluffy dog the good boy, the right man we now know that is... looks like that <laughs> yeah it's oh. like every time i see him i'm like oh look at the little cloud no, yeah it's a little cloud yeah, walking around at you James Gum is having a makeover montage set to Goodbye Horses. It's a song director Goodbye. Demi first heard a demo of when riding in musician Hugh Lazarus's taxi cab. He included it in his earlier film, Married to the Mob, but the song has become synonymous with this scene, which sees Gum dance into the camera and infamously tuck away his Jane Jimmy and gumballs. James Gum, whose name yeah. sounds like they forgot to finish writing it, is played by Ted Levine, last seen on the kill count in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. So that's another thing that gets quoted a lot, too, is where Jane fucked me. I'd fuck okay. me. Yeah. I fuck me hard. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh! Also, the goodbye horses, like, like, cr like crotch shot. That's always like just this dance scene and created it on set with Demi. It wasn't in the original screenplay. Crawford touches down in Chicago and joins a SWAT team surrounding uh. Gum's home. In his basement, Gum discovers that Catherine has managed to lure Precious into the hole Aww. with her. While Buffalo Bill might be a heartless killer, he does have a soft spot for his good boy. Hey, don't you hurt my dog! Don't you make me hurt your dog! The situation escalates further as an undercover officer rings the doorbell, ready to burst Gum's bubble. Gum arms himself and leaves to answer the door, but as the FBI storms in, we realize they're at the wrong Address. The person ringing Gum's doorbell is actually Clarice. Editor Craig McKay didn't initially cut the scene with parallel action, but Demi decided it'd play better with both scenes happening simultaneously. <laughs> it's a masterpiece fake out. That's yes, good. it's one of the best ones I've, I've ever seen. I think that actually inspired the end of Saw too, if I had to guess. I wouldn't doubt it, because you simultaneously, you know, you you they go you go through the motions together, and you're seeing you're what you think. That's the other thing too, from Jane from Jane Gum's like perspective, we're thinking that we're seeing the other side of like Jack Crawford's, but instead we're seeing 
Clarice's, which we've seen none of, mm -hmm. up until the point where he opens the door. And that, oh, that's so good. It, once again, masterclass filmmaking from John Denny. It's been referenced a bunch, most recently in The Black Phone. Gum gives a fake name and claims to remember Frederica only in passing. Oh, wait. Was she a great big fat person? <laughs> you gotta work on your icebreakers, Gum. He chews over his options and invites Starling inside, where she starts to grow suspicious after seeing a giant roll of shrink wrap and textile materials. And, oh yeah, the friggin' moth. Time to pull out her bazooka on this Joe. Clarice orders him to stick around, but the wriggly Gum just giggles and runs away. She follows him downstairs and discovers Gum's ghastly experiment, a partially finished woman suit made from the skin of his victims. Buffalo Bill was the amalgamation of several real-life serial killers, most prominently Ed Gein for his skin suit mm -hmm. and the messy state of his house. His fake injury kidnapping ruse was inspired by Ted, Ted Bundy, Bundy, while his basement pit prison is based on Gary Heidnick of Philadelphia. Therese busts down another door, where she discovers what the internet tells me is the body of Mrs. Lippman, which gum has left to lose its flavor in the bathtub. Mm. Oh man, it's gonna get all moldy! A blackout prevents Clarice from getting a better look. That reminds me of uh, the freaking <laughs> uh, twisted song. Oh, yeah. Dirty bodies in the bathtub for over two whole weeks, and the smells deadly. Pieces of the flesh fall from off the bone and from on the top of the water like confetti. <laughs> God, mercy. Right? Oh, you love it. You gotta love it. <laughs> Crazy dudes, man. Yeah. That loony like motherfuckers. Lunatic. I'm laughing like a lunatic. <laughs> While Gum dons his night vision goggles. Are they heavy? Then they're expensive. Put them back. Clarice is left scrambling in the dark, and Gum gets cocky with his stalking, reaching out to almost stroke her hair. He tries to double his pleasure with the use of a gun, but that cockiness is too loud, so Clarice spins around and shoots him dead. It shatters a window and lets in sunlight, allowing us to see him bleed out proper. Backup arrives to take care of Catherine and her new dog, and since defeating Gum has put her in the big league, Clarice gets an FBI badge. Hell At the yeah. graduation party, she catches up with Ardelia, Pilcher, Roden, and is, is that a kid? Whose kid is that? Crawford pulls her aside for a Paul Hollywood handshake of approval, but he's not the only one who wants to congratulate her. Starling. Wow, Clarice. Have the lamb stopped screaming? The fucking fly on the side of his head. That always irked me so bad. Uh, also, also, uh, you know, there was actually, uh, I forget uh, which producer it was. There was a producer that stated that they wanted a potential relationship between Jack Crawford and Clarice. And I think it was Scott Glenn who shot it down immediately because he's just like, no, I'm a father figure. I'm not, I'm not a romantic interest. Mm. Plus, not only that, I'm 30 years older than her. So, no, that's not happening. And rightfully so, because Jack Crawford, he's basically like the paternal figure that helps Clarice get you know, get to become, like, a full-fledged FBI agent. And I think that's a perfect... That's perfect for him. Doesn't need to be anything more than that. And the and the whole intimacy thing is just like, ugh. Once again, clouding up shit where it doesn't need to be. Yeah, not to mention it would have made it weird. Very weird. As is, he's, he's not the only one. one of the only other, like, protagonists in the movie besides her, pretty much. Yeah. Him, and I would also... Well, Hannibal's a antagonist but he's also a protagonist and he's it's a weird one it's a weird one with Hannibal but yeah he's really the only one who like well he believes in Clarice that's the thing you could call Hannibal an anti-hero emphasis on the anti oh yeah <laughs> like, he puts the I in anti-hero like, I guess he helps the movie's plot be resolved but he's also fucking evil yes <laughs> so. he is evil but yet yeah, Jack is like the proper supporting father figure for Clarice to grow up and to, like, become a full-fledged agent. And I think that's how it needs to be. Anyone who tried to, like, make a romantic relationship between these two, it's, it's weird, dude. Stop it. Get some help. Who wants to congratulate her? Starling. Wow, well, Clarice. Have the lamb, lamb stop screaming. Hannibal is calling from Jamaica, but only briefly, since Dr. Chilton has just arrived. I do wish we could chat longer, but I'm having an old friend. The movie ends with Dr. Lecter stalking <laughs> Such a Dr. Good Chilton, pun. wearing mm -hmm. his finest Panama hat and linen suit. How many people in this movie got Buffalo killed? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Oh, uh, so, sorry, what am I supposed to do with this? Oh, the fucking lotion in the basket! Okay, alright. 
Here. Weird guy. <laughs> I counted 10 kills in the Silence of the Lambs, with the victims consisting of eight men and two women. That gives us this pie chart, which would go well with a nice Chianti, and a count and gender breakdown that's only been seen three times before on this show. Ugh, Jack Frost. <laughs> with a runtime of 119 minutes, better. that gave us a kill on average just about every 12 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Lieutenant Boyle. It's one of the bloodier kills in the movie, and his post-mortem display is yeah. disturbing and strangely beautiful. Yeah. Dolmage Eddie for Lamas kill goes to the paramedics, who died off screen and without a fun body reveal later. And that's it. The Silence of the Lambs came out on Valentine's Day in 1991 and was the number one movie for five weekends, grossing $272 million. Yeah. It wouldn't have a sequel until 10 years later, though, which I'll be looking at next week. Animal. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. On well, the next Kill Count. 10 years after The Silence of the Lambs, Clarice Starling is back, and she hasn't changed a bit. I'm Special Agent Starling. Uh, no. She's changed quite a bit. As she's played by Julianne Moore and not Jodie Foster. <laughs> well, aside from her now being played by <laughs> Julianne Moore, but at least Hannibal Lecter hasn't changed. So what do you think? Wait, what? That's Gary oh, Oldman. Sorry, that's Gary Oldman covered in Come prosthetics on, and playing a Venture Brothers villain. Bingo. Sir Am... <laughs> you, remember, you remember Venture Brothers? It's like, it's like yes, panda milk. Absolutely delicious. <laughs> Then he is still our Hannibal the Cannibal, and he's ready for a little taste of Italy. I've enjoyed many excellent meals there. The good doctor cordially invites you to this Ridley Scott-directed sequel. Other guests include a perpetually hungover, chain-smoking Italian cop. I am a professional. A wealthy, sadistic former patient who looks like a rebooted Freddy Krueger. That's almost funny now. A sleazy Ray Liotta who's out to prove he's got as much brain as brawn. Wouldn't mind having to go with you right now if you want to reconsider. In the gym, anytime, no pads. And a whole lot of man-eating pigs. Who was right? You should have called this the silence of the hams. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> RSVP to this nightmare dinner party by watching Hannibal for yourself this week. Why not? Then on Friday, grab yourself a straw full of scotch and watch the kill count. Only on dead meat. Okie dokie. Here we go. Hannibal. Currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Demi always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before its kill count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this kill count on the Silence of the Lamb. I've already seen Hannibal. I'm not. You haven't? It's all right. Not anywhere near as good as this, but I still think it's got its worth. I have very little respect for Ridley Scott anymore. Yeah. Mm. You know that's I used actually. I love Ridley Scott, but I don't anymore. Yeah, that's actually one of the reasons why Jodie Foster said no, is because apparently Ridley Scott made changes to the screenplay at the last minute, and she was like, nah. Who would have thunk? Ridley Scott thinking he knows better than other people. Well, I directed the first Alien film, so I should be the one to finish the story and tell people how it should be. It's like, go fuck yourself. Oh, yeah. You would have been all for it if you had a, had a good idea, but you <laughs> fucking didn't. Here's what I'll say to you, Ridley Scott. James Cameron did a better job on the sequel. Indeed. Ugh. I'd rather have James Cameron come back and finish the fucker. Much rather that. Because at least he's still making good movies. Last movie, last good movie Ridley Scott made was The Martian. That's it. I, before that, I can't think of a good film that he's done. One that I even remotely consider great. I would have much, 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 much more much the other day. Maybe. Neil Blomkamp was yeah. directing? Yeah, I would have... trying to do before Ridley Scott came in. It's like, no, 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 I have to do with, mine first. With a script so good that not only Sigourney Weaver, but Michael Behan were both coming back for. That's how good the script was. Hicks and Ripley were both coming back. And instead, the Alien sequel we all deserve is in video game form. <sighs> with isolation. Yeah. So, it's a prequel, so... Yeah. Is, uh, no, it's, no, it's a sequel. No, it's a sequel to the original Alien, but a prequel to Aliens because yeah, of the yeah, yeah, yeah. incident that, where that Ripley was, was in cryostasis for too long. It's like a pre-sequel. Yeah. A pre or something. I don't know. A press-quel. Yeah, this is definitely one of the biggest movies to be covered on the Kill Count. 
Although I am curious to see how it works with modern day audiences. One, it's from the early 90s, which at this point is over 30 years old. Yeah, sorry to remind you, I I'm right there with you. And two, everyone knows Hannibal, but they might know him more by name or even by the NBC series. Like, do they know that the Silence of the Lambs is where Hannibal came from? Well, I mean, it came from Manhunter, but yeah, the Silence of the Lambs is where he got popular. I don't know, I'm really curious to see how this does. For what it's worth, if you haven't seen it, even if you just finished watching this kill count, go watch Silence of the Lambs. It's a great fucking movie. And it's the most grounded Hannibal performance you'll see from Anthony Hopkins. In the next two movies, he just gets real, uh, real crazy with it. I want to thank some patrons. <laughs> yes. Patrons like Gator Goat Johnny, Dusty Heyman, Firehale, Ezekiel Steele, Roderick Hare, Mahela Peters, Mariah, Jackson Warren, Silent Z, and Eric R. Thanks, everyone. Be good people. So yeah, Silence of the Lambs, one of the greatest films of all time. And I agree with that statement. It's a great, like, horror slash suspense film. Let's see, when did I watch... Sounds of the Lambs with Quinn. Wow, 2018. Holy shit. <laughs> Let's see if we got that reaction on camera. <laughs> oh yeah, I had to censor that. Where where Bill goes full buff. Is that the mansion? Uh, no, that's actually the roadhouse. Okay. That was before the mansion. So, this is the year I joined you guys, right? Or yep. I joined later in the year. Than this. Oh, come on. I don't, yeah, I don't you know what my know. reference is that I definitely was with you guys by 2018. What's that? The fact that we just watched uh, The Odd Ones Out and you mentioned the 2018 rewind that I definitely reacted to with you guys. <laughs> my god. Let's see. Hold on. Let's, let's look at Rewind 2018. Oh gosh. Yeah. PewDiePie's YouTube Rewind. YouTube Rewind 2019. There it is. YouTube Rewind 2018. Oh my gosh. PewDiePie's YouTube Rewind. And then, yeah, but it's actually good. Gmod, De yeah. Rewind 2019. Wow. I'm just, I'm just going back through all the history here. Jeez, man, I'm feeling old. All right. Speaking of feeling old, this movie was out when I was born, which is now over 30 years ago. So we're going to end it here. And I don't know what else to say except for check out more from Dead Meat. Because... You know that homie's just gonna keep, you know, putting these out and just make it, just make it and everyone just squeam from all the kills and everything. But hey, that's just, that's it, that's part of his job, damn it. And you do your job well, James. So, <clears throat> anyway, till next time, I am Nate. I am Nick. Y'all be good people. Take care. Peace.